Good morning, folks. Welcome to another chip break. I am really excited to announce we did a second uh, edition of prints with Graham over at Diode Press. He made these Arduino circuit board prints and they look awesome. I definitely would say that the camera doesn't do them justice. One of the things that he did was he embossed and traced uh, all these trace routes and he's got his logo in there and the Saunders Machine Works logo and the NYC CNC logo. And I just think they're really cool. So it's a limited edition, a run of 25, link here. In the last edition that we did with him was a side view of the Tormach, which I think is so cool. Uh, we've actually got one that we are keeping up here in the front of our hallway. And it's a really cool way, I think, to add some, some shop decor to, uh, to your, or artwork to your shop. So thanks again to Grant for doing that. And if you're interested in purchasing one of these, link in the video description. Let's talk about the VMC. First update, where are we going to put it in the concrete pad? Right there. I'm, I'm gonna move that Tormach 1100 over, probably to right here. I like this. Uh, you know, the, I, I would have mentioned originally putting it where the other 1100 is next to that pole, um, but what, a couple things. One is I just put it there because I knew that pole wasn't moving, so it was a sort of a permanent place. But um, I like it here because I'm going to use it and it's a little bit closer to, to my area, at least for now. And the reality is I can't just put it over there because I know that's permanent. It's not something I want to move, but you can move it. In fact, um, I was next door at a factory that's got 40 VMCs talking to the plant manager. And it's kind of crazy. They move their machines around all the time. I'm not saying that's a great use of time or something that's fun to do, but they've got a, a forklift and a set of skates and they're going through a sort of a, continuously going through changes and tweaks and all that. So I don't want to freak out about that. Um, if you guys followed us on social media, I think on both Instagram and Facebook, I was concerned because I had the prints for this building and it's only five inch concrete at 3000 PSI. And Haas sends you a bunch of information on setting up and getting the new machine and they request six inches at 3500 PSI. So we're below spec. Now, I did a bunch of research and talking. Uh, I talked to the riggers that we're using, who, really smart guy, uh, the folks that moved all that equipment for us, uh, the old manual machines, and they are also a fabrication company, and he coincidentally, literally that day, was pouring a new pad for their 175 ton brake. So they've got mechanical engineers, civil engineers, they know their stuff. He said, don't worry about it, the factory next door, they also have eight inch concrete, but they said, don't worry about it. Yes, pouring a new pad isn't too expensive. My concern would be twofold. Honestly, one is that um, I, I'm cutting into my new perfect floor and if, if, that were, if we needed to do it, I would do it, end of conversation. But I don't wanna do it if I don't have to. The other question was putting plates underneath it, either individual plates under the feet or across all of them. Uh, doesn't seem like that's really going to help. So there's two sort of two different problems. One is, is the machine gonna break the floor? And then the other is, is the floor being under spec going to cause a long-term accuracy problem? So number one, I, no, I don't think the machine, the floor is gonna break. I'm a little nervous when we bring a 20,000 pound forklift carrying a 16,000 pound machine on it in, but uh, you know, there's sort of nothing you can do about that. And I'm still not too worried that has a little bit less, I think, to do with the floor and more to do with the um, sub, what do you call it, the substrate or the subsurface. In other words, is the concrete over really good, uh, you know, gravel and, and soil and so forth? Because obviously, if there's a cavity underneath there, the concrete becomes a bridge and that may crack. Uh, the other question, though, is a better question. Long term, is the floor going to flex so much? that it causes problems with the machine? And the answer is it may well. Uh, and if that's the case, we will do something about it. We will move the machine and we'll cut the floor and we'll pour a new pad or, or whatever. I also called, uh, t uh, Tim, one of our viewers, mentioned these isolation pads and I called that company and they do this stuff all the, all the day long and they were, they were also like, we'd love to sell you our product, but it's not, you, that, that, that's a lightweight machine and don't worry about it. By that point too, if I'm going to cut the slab, at least then I'll have a better idea of where I want to put the machine permanently. Maybe I could recoat the floors too. Oh, I also wanted to mention when you pour concrete, the longer it cures, the better off it is. So I don't really want to frantically stop everything I'm doing, 
go get bids to saw cut and pour that concrete and then rush to put a machine on top of it. I, yes, I know you can do fast curing concrete and so forth, but just my thought, sort of thought was, okay, it, you know, even Haas said you should be fine because their six inch spec covers a pretty wide range of machines and the consensus seems to be that it's uh, probably a conservative spec. So I'm not worried about it. I'm conscious of it. And again, if it's something we need to fix going down the road, we will, because that's the truth. Even the next door with the eight inch pad, they know when you drive a fork truck next to a machine, it pushes down on the pad. When you push down on that concrete pad, you're gonna cause the machine to flex. And when machines flex, tolerances change, period. They said, try to minimize the number of saw cut slabs that you span. So if I put the machine right here, I've got one joint right there. Um, there's another joint running right there, but I can stay on this side of it. So it'll only be spanning two. And I think we're gonna be fine at least for now. So that's the update there. Well, the, the other reason, no joke is, uh, it's a shorter electrical run from the panel right there up over and then do a drop right there, which matters because it's a 70 amp breaker and all else equal shorter wire run is good for now. Let's talk about costs. So I thought I'd share this. This is crazy. Uh, it was three grand for the freight from California that was handled through Haas. Uh, I don't know the exact price for my rigger. I hope that's actually high, but and I'll let you know. Haas drives the machine from California straight to my driveway. And then my rigging company comes and there's like a handoff of responsibility and they unload it and we'll bring it into the shop and kind of we'll get it going there. I estimate electrical wiring is gonna cost me about 600 bucks to do that work. That might be light, we'll see. Tool holders first order, we'll come right back to that. Uh, that's gonna get me 13 though. I would guess that's minimum another 3,600 to get more uh, tool holders and studs. That's not tooling, that's just cat 40s. I did buy a, help if I can spell, Sandvik certificate for tooling. So the way that works with new machines, your machinery dealer or distributor usually has a connection with Sandvik or Iskar or Kenna Metal, and they'll hook you up with a, usually it's 50% off discount. So I spent two grand to get $4,000 in Sandvik tooling. The $4,000 though is applied at retail pricing. So um, for instance, a Sandvik tool holder, Cat 40 is about, I think 180. And we're gonna buy Meritools at about 100. Um, and I'm gonna do that because I can get Meritools normally at 100 all day long. Whereas the Sandvik tooling I wanna buy, their face mills or cutters or drills, those are something I can't buy elsewhere. So I'm gonna try to save that certificate for actual cutting tools. Um, two orange vices, that's four grand for now. I probably want more, but two will get me going. So that's already up to 16K. So the first order I wanted to place, I haven't pulled uh, the trigger because I thought maybe somebody will have something to say. Maritool has a pretty awesome Haas or whatever your machine is, Cat 40 tooling package that gets us six tool holders for through coolant, sets of ER collets. So you can look through the list here, it's a thousand bucks. Uh, set of collets for ER16, ER32, and draw studs. I'm gonna pick that up. I'm going to get a three quarter inch, actually, you know what, I'm gonna get two of those because one of them is gonna hold a shear hog for now, and the other one is my backup that'll hold any TTS tool. If in a pinch, I need to put a tool that I don't have a VMC holder for, that I've got a TTS holder for, I can stick a TTS in a three quarter inch. Uh, I know that won't be ideal or perfectly rigid, but it seems smart to me for now. I am gonna buy a couple of quarter inch set screw holders for now. We use so much quarter inch tooling and I'm kind of curious to compare them against collet holding. Uh, I've got a bunch of ER20 collets, so I'm gonna buy one, two ER20 Cat40 holders. Uh, I'm gonna pick up one ER20 ceiling collet. So when you use through spindle coolant, it pumps high pressure about 300 PSI coolant through the center of your spindle and out the center of the tool. If you don't use a sealed collet, the coolant will leak out the slits of the, of the collet. I guess sometimes that's a good thing because if you have a tool that doesn't have holes in the tool, like a drill or an end mill for through spindle, having it come out the collet can actually be somewhat intentionally good. Uh, I wanna see how it works with a sealed collet. That's 32 bucks. Face mill, that's the holder. I'll come back to which one we're gonna buy. 
and I'm gonna get a uh, just one, I guess they're, God, they're expensive, uh, Cat 40 drill chuck. Apparently these aren't super popular. They're expensive too, so part of me thinks I'd rather use an ER collet system for holding drills, taps, etc. Actually, I probably won't hold a tap in this, but I wanna have one on hand. Some pool studs and a little wrench. So that's now gonna be a little over two grand. Face mills, so interesting debate. Uh, Cal Pay and who else? Tim Paul and some other folks have really, really recommended this Mitsubishi. Uh, either the ASX or the WSX 445. Just primo finishes a great face mill. So to some extent, that's the answer. However, I really like the Sandvik uh, guy that comes here and I have a much better relationship with him. And so I want to think about that as well. Um, and, and I think they're going to be able to bring them over and do a heads up before I buy them. Two options there. The RA245 is, is probably the easier one for me to go with. Or there's another one called the 590 that a couple people really like. My buddy Amish just bought it. And I have a note to myself somewhere here down here that Locked Tool had posted a photo on Instagram with, with a 590. The problem with the 590, take a look at this photo on, on Amish's Instagram. You should follow him too, by the way. He just bought a five axis thing, it was sweet. You have to use a tool presetter because the insert pockets are all adjustable. Why are they adjustable? Because anything that's machined is not perfect. So these things have this toggle cam that lets you dial in tenths to get all of the inserts perfectly coplanar, which is awesome but crazy. I don't have a tool presetter or a, a instrument to go around and test those. I was thinking you might be able to use the Renishaw tool touch probe in the Haas, but it would be a pain to put it in there, test it, take it back out. So I don't know, but the 590 is a really good face mill. And I'm thinking, do I, if I am gonna just need some, um, Amish doesn't have a tool presetter. I think he's just using a brown and sharp digital height gauge. I gotta figure that out. So that's the next question is what face mill to buy. Oh, possible drill feeds and speeds. So uh, Corey, the Sandvik rep is over. We were talking about drilling, uh, pre-drilling for half 13 tapped holes, which is I think like, a, I don't know, 462 diameter at the top of my head. And he was saying with a Sandvik 200 and some dollar carbide through coolant drill, it would be something like 30 thou per rev at 15K RPMs. That equates to, I think, 440 inches a minute. No pecking. Literally, boom, 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 boom. Crazy. And I said, my first question was, okay, what's tool life or drill life? And he said the Sandvik spec, which is usually conservative, uh, is 17,000 holes. Oh my God. So I think we're going to pick up something like that. I'm very curious to try it and see. Maybe we back it off some. Cra whole nother world. Crazy. And last thing would be uh, when it arrives. So I am unfortunately traveling. I have a training class the second week of November, and then the third week I'm in Las Vegas teaching that AU class, uh, Autodesk University training class. So the machine is going to come on Monday or Tuesday, the week of Thanksgiving. So that's the 21st or the 22nd, which so it's my fault because I'm gone for two weeks basically. But um, awesome. We got a month from now. So let me know if you have any comments on that marital order because otherwise I'm going to pull the trigger on that. It's funny. Everyone loves Maritool. I like Maritool. I got to meet Frank, uh, the owner of the company at IMTS, and we've used some of their tooling and end mills. We like their little uh, drill index cards. They're my favorite ones. It's just kind of funny. Like They've done a great job of building a business out of just really quality, value, good prices, made in America. So it's almost like a no-brainer. I'm, I'm, I, I, it's kind of a funny phenomenon to me how pervasive and how good they are. Everyone just says good things. So I'm excited to try that. And got to keep learning. None of this covers the five axis work holding. We did buy the TR200Y, so it's the larger of the two. The downside is I can't leave it on the machine. And that's a big problem because these things are a pain in the butt to, to set in there and tram in and it weighs about 350 pounds. So what's that mean? That means I got to figure out a, a way to do that to get it on there quickly and smart. So do I build an overhead crane or a jib crane or some sort of a hoist? And then do I pin it in or a fixture plate or something? Because I gotta figure that out, but I don't want it to live on the machine full time. 
So with that, folks, let me know what questions you have. This is, we, we've learned a lot, a lot more to learn. I appreciate it, folks. And if you guys want to support the channel, pick up one of those prints from, from Graham we just made with the Arduino thing. Take care. See you soon. Yeah.